My dearly beloved in Christ, I am sure you are well aware of the news that has been talked of recently and especially today of the canonization ceremony that took place this morning in Rome of two of the popes of Vatican II, John the 23rd, who started Vatican II, and John Paul II, who implemented it, especially in his travels throughout the world. And so I think it is important to make a few comments on this occasion. But first of all, why this day? Last summer, Francis Bergoglio announced that he would canonize these two men. And then in September, the date of canonization was set for today, which is, of course, the Sunday after Easter. We call it Low Sunday. But in the new church, there is very much propagated and spread the devotion called the Divine Mercy. And it is on this Sunday that there are special promises for this devotion. And I'm sure you're familiar with the picture which shows our Lord with rays of light coming forth from his heart, red and white, reminding us of the words of Christ, uh, the words of the Gospels, that when our Lord's side was pierced, there came out blood and water. But why this devotion? Or why, should I say, was it forbidden in the church before Vatican II? I would like to read, to begin, a decree of the uh, Holy Office, and this was in 1937 regarding new devotions, because there were a number of new devotions that sprang up in the 20th century, individuals claiming they had a vision and were supposed to practice this devotion or that devotion, and this is what the Holy Office said. New forms of worship and devotion, often enough ridiculous, usually useless imitations or corruptions of similar ones which are already legitimately established, are in many places, especially in these recent days, being daily multiplied and propagated among the faithful, giving occasion to great astonishment and to bitter aspersion on the part of non-Catholics. Again, that was a, degree, a decree in 1937 by which the church was saying, we're not going to approve just any devotion that comes along. Many of them are useless um, reproductions or um, imitations of ones that had already been legitimately established. And that is a very important point, because once this new devotion of divine mercy began to be spread throughout the modern church, what happened? Devotion to the Sacred Heart disappeared. And what are our two primary devotions to our Lord? They are the devotions of the Sacred Heart and of our Lord present in the Blessed Sacrament, the Holy Eucharist. But these fell into disuse or very much put on the side as this devotion to divine mercy is so, prom promulgated, is so propagated. So the question then comes up, why did the church disallow it. So I'll quote from you the decree of March 6, 1959, quote, the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office, having examined the alleged visions and revelations of Sister Faustina Kowalska of the Institute of Our Lady of Mercy, who died in 1938 near Krakow, has decreed as follows, the distribution of pictures and writings which present the devotion to the divine mercy in the forms proposed by this sister Faustina should be forbidden. So that was the case before Vatican II, and that uh, prohibition remained in effect until 1978. Now in 1978, through the efforts of one Polish bishop, this was reversed by the Vatican, again after Vatican II. And of course that Polish bishop was named Wojtyla, Carol Wojtyla, who some six months later was then elected as John Paul II and began to spread this devotion throughout the modern church. So the question comes up then, why was it forbidden? Some have said perhaps because there is the wounds of our, are not present in our Lord's hands and feet on this, on this picture. But primarily, I believe, the reason why it was forbidden 
was because of the promise that this sister Faustina claimed our Lord had made to her. And this is what she wrote in her diary. On that day, speaking of the Sunday after Easter, which they called Divine Mercy Sunday, on that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which the graces graces flow are opened. So this is a very serious theological problem. She is claiming that our Lord told her that if you go to confession and Holy Communion on the Sunday after Easter, all temporal punishment will be wiped away of all your sins. All your sins will be forgiven and all the temporal punishment will be wiped away. In fact, one theologian who propagated this devotion called it a second baptism. And that terminology has never been used for any sort of devotion. As though it's automatic, you do this every year on the Sunday after Easter, go to Holy Communion, go to Confession, Holy Communion, and you have a clean slate. Everything is wiped away. And that is primarily the reason why this devotion was condemned by the church. We know there is purgatory. We know we have temporal punishment due to our sins, and we try to wipe away all the temporal punishment due to our sins by prayer, by receiving the sacraments, by receiving indulgences, by charitable works, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, by self-denial, and so forth. But we do not believe it's so easy as just going to communion on a particular day and then everything is wiped away. So that is why this devotion, again, was forbidden. Now, as I mentioned, John Paul II very much promulgated or propagated this devotion. And that is why this day was chosen for this canonization ceremony. So in Rome this morning, these two men were declared saints by the so-called Pope of the Novus Ordo Church, the Conciliar Church, Jorge Bergoglio, or he goes by the name Pope Francis, and he declared them saints. One of the things that's interesting is that if you look back to traditional canonizations, canonizations are, have always been considered infallible, and uh, there's a very severe process of reviewing the life of such a person before he or she is canonized. And canonizations are few and far between. However, after Vatican II, they began to be multiplied. It is said that John Paul II, who had a reign of almost 27 years, canonized and beatified more individuals than all previous popes combined. So it's it's a very common thing, it seems, anymore. And what's interesting is that traditionally, for a canonization to take place, there had to be four miracles certified, two for beatification and two more for canonization, miracles which were unquestionably of divine origin, could not be explained medically by science. And in the case of John XXIII, they didn't even have the one miracle that they're looking for, so Francis just waived that requirement and said, I'm going to canonize him anyway. And with John Paul II, there are two dubious miracles that were used. But traditionally, there were so many miracles for a saint, like you can take the little flower or whatever saint you choose that was canonized before Vatican II. There were so many miracles, the church had to sort through and decide which four are we going to use because there were so many. And of course, miracles are a heavenly ratification or approval, approbation, that this person is a saint. Well, obviously you can see by what I'm saying that I don't believe these two individuals were saints. Far from it. And in fact, I do not believe they were true popes. John XXIII began Vatican II. Shortly after his election, he announced to the surprise of the cardinals, I'm going to call a council. And then someone said, well, what's the purpose of the council? And he walked across the room and opened a window and he said, I'm going to let some fresh air into the church. Well, Vatican II inaugurated the whole movement of modernism and liberalism, changing everything. In fact, someone asked John XXIII after he was elected, what kind of pope will you be? 
And he said, think of Pope Pius XII and what he would do, and I will do just the opposite. And in fact, he did constantly do the opposite of what true popes like Pope Pius XII did. Now, he was uh, there for only a short time. He died in the summer of 1963, so slightly less than five years, four and a half years. But he began Vatican II. Then Paul VI uh, completed Vatican II, and incidentally, it was announced that Paul VI will be beatified some six months from now. So it seems like very little is required. Uh, but then John Paul II came along, was elected in 1978, and as I said, was a supposed pope for nearly 27 years. During that time, he traveled all over the world and participated in various forms of interfaith service, ecumenism, joining and worshiping in common with every sort of religion under the sun. He went into a Jewish synagogue, kissed the Koran, worshipped in common with Muslims, Jews, uh, Protestants, and every sort of religion you can imagine. Even voodoo that he participated in. And he had these infamous prayer meetings in Assisi twice, where he invited practitioners of all these different religious religions to come together and pray for peace together with him in Assisi, desecrating the tomb of St. Francis of Assisi as though he is somehow some, a patron of this, this ecumenism, this interfaith uh, promoted by Vatican II. So we could say that John Paul II cemented Vatican II in place. He again promoted it throughout the world and he died in 2005. When he died, there was a very large crowd of people who went to Rome for the funeral, of course from his native Poland, from, from all over Europe, because everybody loved John Paul II, this charismatic uh, pope. Um, and people were shouting out at the time, Santo Subito, the Italian for make him a pope quickly, a pope quickly. And uh, Benedict XVI said he would do just that and beatified him, I think, five years later after his death. Now, normally when a person dies who is considered a saint, the process of beatification, canonization, doesn't even begin for years after the death. But all of those traditional requirements were waived, and we're going to start the process right away. So it was obvious they were going to canonize him very soon. Um, my particular opinion or belief on why these two canonizations is because it is an effort to canonize Vatican II, to say, well, these men were saints, and look what they gave us. They gave us Vatican II. So it really is more than a canonization of these individuals. It is a declaration that Vatican II is the way to go. And of course, Vatican II overturned all previous councils of the church, brought in a new religion. Vatican II even taught that false religions, of course, it didn't call them that, but non-Catholic religions can save you. You can be saved by joining other churches. Vatican II taught religious liberty, that you have the right to choose whatever religion you want and that everyone else must respect, including the state, must respect your choice of religion. Now, we would respond by saying, well, it's true that people have free will and they have the freedom of choice, but that doesn't mean we have to say that, that, that God is pleased with that choice or that the state must approve that choice. So it, in effect, dethroned Christ the King. So Vatican II was the, was the uh, promulgation of modernism, which had been condemned by the church. And now you have these two individuals promoting it, especially John Paul II in his many travels visiting over a hundred countries and promoting Vatican II. We should be grateful that we have the true faith. Give thanks to God that we are sticking with the faith of our fathers, the faith of Saints Peter and Paul and the other apostles, the faith of all the canonized saints from before Vatican II, the, saint, the faith that was practiced and taught and lived down through the centuries. But what is being promoted as Catholicism today in the modern church, the churches that still use the name Catholic, the structures, is not the same religion. It is not the same faith. It is a new religion. Now, there are people 
in that religion who were born, baptized, raised Catholics and, and have been deceived. And maybe they still have the faith in their hearts. Many of them do. But I would venture to say that the vast majority of those who are in the Novus Ordo Church believe a different religion. They believe that birth control is fine. Many of them even approve of abortion, homosexual marriage, and so on and so forth. Because they have been, their thinking has been changed by the sermons they hear Sunday after Sunday or Saturday evening after Saturday evening in the modern church. We stick with the faith of our fathers. And I would close with the, the wonderful uh, sermon, or it was actually a letter, of St. Athanasius, who was so persecuted uh, in the 4th century, Bishop of Alexandria, and he had to leave his diocese, go into hiding on quite a few occasions. But he communicated with the parishioners, with his flock, in letters. And in one of these letters, he was speaking about the Arians, and these words are so apropos today. He said, they have the churches, but you have the faith. They have the buildings, but they do not have the true religion. You have the faith. Which is more important, the buildings or the true religion? So they may have St. Peter's in the Vatican and perform all these ceremonies. They may even have control of the tombs of the saints in these great basilicas and churches, etc., but there no longer is the true faith there. Let us not be deceived, and let us hold fast to the true faith, the faith of the church for 2,000 years before Vatican II, the faith that we love and that we pray we will persevere in living until our dying breath. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.